villages instead of cities. That's a farm right there, a place where he lives. This is a house. This seems to be a barn where grain is stored. A greenhouse is whole life centered around that. Buggies instead of cars. $3,500 guys. How it differs from these? I don't know. Sports instead of the internet. What games do you play? Volleyball. Volleyball and a softball. Yeah. Unusual traditions. But you use cars for farming. So special cars are... Uh, tractors, no? And strict rules. Imagine how you could be happy without the internet, without social media. Who are these people who live in the past? It's the Amish. And today, we are going to visit them. Who are the Amish? Tell us a person who lived with them for five days. The Amish, that's our future. The Amish population doubles every 20 years. So after a certain number of years, 95% of the world's population will be Amish and the remaining 5% will be their drivers because they need drivers and they can't drive themselves. It's really only partly a joke because there really are more and more of them. Despite the fact that they have a lifestyle completely incomprehensible to modern man. Well, imagine how you can be happy without the internet, without social media. Varlamov, imagine being happy without the internet. Generally speaking, not all Amish people give up the internet altogether. Some people do use it, though only out of necessity. Finding an Instagram star among the Amish is definitely not going to work. So to see their lives, I had to go to them myself. And traveling with me was an American blogger, a good friend of mine, Dennis. You may know him on YouTube, his nickname is Samske Basel, I said to myself. He makes videos in Russian about New York and other US cities. I decided not to tell you much about the Amish right away, so you could see their everyday life first. We will talk about them in more detail later. I went to the Amish that live in Lancaster County in the state of Pennsylvania. This county is notable for the fact that out of the half million local population, approximately 10% are Amish. Look, it's the Amish towels drying. There's the buggy. Wow, it's really a buggy right there. We've come to one of the places where the Amish live in a very large quantities, quite concentrated, therefore there is an opportunity to observe their lives as if you're part of it. You can tell it's an Amish neighborhood even by the roads. It's paved differently. Whereas the roads we drive on, they have about the same wear and tear. Here, due to these narrow wheels, you see these stripes on the road, but in the middle, there's also a trail of horse hoof stumps. Sometimes they have these renovations where they change these stripes in the road. The rest of the road is perfectly normal. And this part here is a little broken with horse hoofs, though most of the roads are near perfect. But you can see it straight away. There's a lot of buggies driving these roads, with trails of horse hoof stumps on this side and on that side. But if you go a little further, there's a mix. Because the Amish, they don't live as colonies. They don't live concentrated together. They live among ordinary people. This is where the usual American lives, and the next door there'll be an Amish. The the average American will have a car parked outside, some sort of trampoline for the kids, swimming pool and so on. And the Amish will have a stable, he'll be stabling his horse, he'll have his buggy, maybe some other livestock too. Mostly though, of course, they'll have livestock on farms. Classic Amish life is of course farming. They really want to live that way, even though there's too many of them and not everyone can be a farmer. So here's the farm. It's a huge area, in the center there's a house, a stable, cattle, there's a grain elevator and a bypass. And there's some big family living there. And the next farm, the next big family. So there they are between farms, traveling on a buggy if they need to go somewhere. The farmers, the people who are working with their hands, they are busy all the time. In fact, they practically have no free time, they are always doing something. Well, not least because everything primitive is complex and time consuming. So if an American wants to cut grass, he'll get on his lawnmower and in half an hour everything will be done. The Amish, on the other hand, might get a manual petrol lawnmower or maybe even mow it with a scythe. It also depends on the particular Amish community. 
In some places, some mechanization is allowed and in others it is not. Regarding the buggy traffic, there's a lot of buggies in the morning when they're traveling to work or other business, and a lot in the evening. There are dramatically fewer of them late at night because they find it difficult to drive in the dark. They hardly ever travel at night. You can always tell where the Amish live by the clothes drying outside. They always have it drying outside, because again, talking about automation, one of the few technological advances that all Amish seem to accept is the washing machine. True, they are not like ours. Their washing machines run on gas. This looks very cool, the strangest of this accommodation. You come here and you live in a carriage. It's called a caboose. That is the carriage that used to carry the crew that accompanied the train. Friends, it's an incredible motel. Indeed, they took old carriages and put them in several rows, and every one of them has been converted into a hotel room. Well, you can see the inside in the photos. They are certainly looking a bit old, but on the outside it's a super place, especially for train enthusiasts. I've never seen anything like it. And it's sad that the carriages themselves aren't looking perfect. They're a little rusty, the paint needs some work, the aircon is out of place, I mean, the idea is terrific, but the implementation could have been improved. You can see from the cobwebs here that this room hasn't been occupied for a while. Probably when they came up with the idea, it was cool. And then, as the years went by, it all got a little bit old. This needs to be very much looked after. I lived in it for a few time, but I think that one night here is interesting, but more than that is too much. But it's great that you're coming out of the room and you've got fields all around, the smell of manure. It's actually a former farm. You can go up to the silo tower. It's kind of like an observation tower for them. In the evening they light a big fire and you sit around it with other guests telling some stories. In the barn they're showing movies, they've got like a cinema. Anyway, it's fun, it's entertaining. Most tourist hotels in America tend to be very unsightly, uninteresting. They're all the same. That's at least some variety. The restaurant is a train carriage too, and so is the reception. Everything here is an ex-train carriage. They call it the Red Caboose Hotel. Well, here's one kind of Amish business. The tourists can ride these buggies. There's nobody here right now. But they usually have a guy sitting here, you sit down and he gives you a ride in a buggy. Do you feel this manure smell? That's what this part of Pennsylvania smells like. It smells like this all the time. It's a minivan because there's a passenger compartment. It's really an Amish minivan. You see, there's no glass windows, it's all fitted with these little locks. It's all covered in this transparent film and grey tarpaulin. By the way, each Amish commune has a different color. Here they all ride grey buggies. And in a different place, like New York or Ohio, they have them black. See, he's both in a field and with children at the same time. Such a universal father that solves a lot of family problems at once. But the children are very young. Yes, they've been helping their parents since they were kids working on the farm. Children are accustomed to labor from childhood. They don't have computers, they don't have consoles, they don't have internet, they don't have cartoons. There are only books, conversations with parents and some activities around the house or in the field. In fact, that's what their life is all about. If perhaps they hadn't lived like this all their lives from childhood, they probably wouldn't have been able to preserve their identity because it's instilled right from the mother's milk. Speaking of exploitation of child labor, the kids there are about 5 to 7 years old and they're carrying boxes doing these seedlings. They're seriously helping their parents, very young children. They have children starting to work from about 5 to 6 years of age. How does US law look at this? In that sense, they're like the children of most American farmers. It's not just the Amish. Go to any normal American farm and if there are more than two children, and more often than not that's the case, they'd love to help. I mean, the kids have been working since they were toddlers. This is the most typical scenery for these places. The road running among the fields. That's a farm right there. A place where he lives. 
This is a house. This seems to be a barn where grain is stored. A greenhouse. They are friendly, waving their hands all the time. See this boy with his cool boots? Mom just went to get the post. Here's his garage, his buggy. That's all life is for him. We are moving away from the tourist cluster. As I mentioned, Amish attract a huge amount of attention, but it's fairly localized. There's an area where tourists congregate, where there's a motel, even a Starbucks. Well, everything you need. And we're going a little bit further away now, and there won't be any tourists there. But, on the contrary, there'll be a lot of Amish. That's the kind of cars people drive. I'm too stunned to speak. They're so primitive and ancient, but for the Amish it's just a perfect kind of mechanization. It's primitive, ancient, not at all convenient, but also kind of more efficient than a horse. A big festival of steam tractors is held here once a year. A gathering of people who are passionate not about the internal combustion engines, but the tractors that were around at the very beginning of the last century that were steam powered. It's almost like a steam train, only it's not traveling on the tracks, but it's traveling on the road. And this is where the festival is being held. People from all the surrounding towns and states come here and it's an amazing spectacle. No one has ever seen a show like this. I highly recommend following the link and checking it out. I'm sure you'll be surprised that such a thing even exists. So, for us, it's amazingly striking. But for the Amish, it's such an apogee of technological advancement in their worldview. It's the perfect mode of transport. Transport. Slow, uncomfortable, but its efficiency is greater than that of a horse. I mean, you'll do more than on a horse, but still considerably less than on a modern tractor. It's a strange way of looking at life, but that's what they're like. On the one hand, here's a dude right here plowing with six mules in front of him, but he has this sort of clip-on trailer, a fertilizer or something, that spills some kind of liquid, some kind of seeds maybe, I don't know. And this trailer is quite modern. On the opposite side, there's an absolutely normal modern house with a basketball hoop. They have some solar panels on the roof. We can tell it's an Amish family since there's a horse and all these carts. But right next to it there's a boy about 7 years old that's loading off a pile of manure and mom shoveling the manure. It's such a wild mix of technology and tradition. From the outside, of course, it just looks unbelievable. It's hard to imagine all of this happening in this day and age. He must be sewing something. There is some kind of a fluid and there's also a battery, so electricity is involved in the process. The thing he's got there is automatic. They tolerate technology to a certain extent. I mean, he's got horses, but he's got some sort of mechanized trailer. It happens a lot. The degree of automation is not the same everywhere. It all depends very much on the particular community. So the community gets together and decides that they have a lot of fields and they don't have time to cultivate them all. Because of this, the crop is not harvested on time. And so they need to speed things up. So they decide that this is something that can be automated and so to do that while others will do the most primitive labor, spreading manure for nothing. So that's their decision. That's how they want to live. But of course, the main technology, if we can count it as one, for the Amish is still a wagon. Well, a buggy, as they call it around here. Here's a spring suspension. This one actually has brakes. It has brake drums on the back wheels, it got lights. You can see it in the evening, they've got indicators and so on. But they've been made to have all that. They didn't want it at all. They wanted it to be as primitive as possible, but in the end, it came to the point where those who didn't have any of the security stuff, they just started getting arrested by the police. Because you can't see them at night when you're driving. You just can't see the buggy in the dark. And now, friends, we're going to take a look at what a car dealership looks like for the Amish, where all these buggies are sold where they're serviced and repaired. We're in a buggy dealership. It's got everything you need. Firstly, gas cans can be refueled here. You can't go anywhere without them. There are various models of these buggies for sale here. This one is $1,500. 
awesome. It's used, I don't know what year is it from. I don't know if it's gone through MOT, but it looks relatively okay, certainly a bit worn, but on the other hand, what's there to break? Here's this amazing sparkling varnish all over buggy. Offers accepted. The price is negotiable because it's glamour, glitz and beauty. It looks new, I think. Look at those springs, not a single bump inside. These wheels don't know horse manure yet. It's all new, guys. Here's a used one, again. There's some sort of an illegible ad, and you need to call someone. Price is negotiable, but we're really not interested. This one here is $1,500. But it's a bit of a mess. What about the $2,500 ones? It seems to be newer. For this money you can get a newer buggy, it has lights at the front. Judging by the $900 price tag, this one is a load of rubbish. On the other hand, I don't see how they are different. They are visually exactly the same. $3,500 guys, this one is $3,500. How it differs from these? I don't know. The interior upholstery is green inside. Of course, it needs a few little tweaks here and there. There is a brake paddle, the controls. Very good. But actually, these don't have windscreen wipers. And this one does, but only one. All of these ones are old, except for that new one there. And here it is again, a brand new buggy, just off the assembly line. Or at least after the renovation, I don't know. This one sold already, it's waiting for its owner. It has new LED lights. The interior is terrific, it smells like paint. The actual interior isn't there yet, but it's probably customized. By the way, just so you know, the Vipers are manual, so you have to operate them manually. And this one's a cargo modification. This is where you can carry the load or put up the benches and a few more people can ride in the back. An announcement, help wanted. We need someone to work with our team in building. Repairing and restoring horse-drawn vehicles. They are willing to pay well to anyone who does a good job. They don't say how much they're willing to pay though. Here are the batteries, new wheels. The price of a new buggy can be as much as $10,000. It's all done manually. Well, friends, what an amazing factory this is. A buggy factory, as one might call it. The place where these amazing buggies are born and then are driving along the roads of Pennsylvania and are a delight to locals and passing tourists. And even though we are not in a buggy, we finally reached an Amish town. Now let's talk about them in more detail. Friends, I came to see the Amish. They are such conservative religious people who lived in close communities, mostly in America and Canada. The life of the Amish is quite different from the life of modern man that we are accustomed to. Some communities still don't have electricity and have horse-drawn carriages instead of cars. Virtually none of them are watching television and listen to the radio, although some of them use the internet. But it's very unlikely they'll find my YouTube channel and watch this video. Also, the Amish have a lot of children. They deny abortion and contraception. They usually have five to seven children in their families. Amish descended from Anabaptist religious radical. Those in turn emerged in the era of the reformation of the 16th century when all over Europe in opposition to the Catholic Church. Various new doctrines were born. The Protestants, the Anglican Church, all of this came into being at the same time as the Anabaptists. The authorities of European countries believed Anabaptists to be heretics, so they persecuted them and drove them out of their territory. The Anabaptists hid from reprisals in the mountains of Switzerland and southern Germany. In 1693 a split occurred there between the leaders of the movement. The protagonist of this controversy was the Swiss leader Jacob Amann, who insisted on stricter discipline in all congregations. He urged more frequent prayer and the use of avoidance method, which is the type of punishment where members of the community ignore the offender until they repent of their sins. Amann did not have the required support and separated from his associates and the men who had followed them were called the Amish, consonant with his surname. 
The kid sees that we're filming him. They're usually very interested in what's happening. You see, the adult waved at us. They're very kind-hearted, they're very humane, nice people who always smile, always wave, say hello to strangers. You come here and you don't feel like some kind of outsider who's being looked down upon. There are the Amish scooters. The restaurant workers, they don't use bicycles, they use scooters like this. Again, it depends on the community. There are communities that have bicycles, but these Amish don't have them. So it's not like we don't have bikes because they're bad, no. It's just that they don't use it and that's it. All our grandfathers didn't use it and we won't. No credit cards accepted. Yes, they only accept cash or checks. Remember the Big Lebowski film where he buys a carton of milk for a check? That's what life's like here too. The woman is relatively old and she's wearing clothes that's well very conservative. She's wearing a bonnet that's covering her face. This carriage is fashionable though. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, it's all very interesting of course, but... Oh, such a noisy lorry. But you feel like you're still doing something wrong. You're filming very good people who don't like to be filmed and they don't say anything. Dennis, do you feel like we're doing something wrong? I feel ashamed, to be honest. It's really embarrassing. I mean, I'd already be filming a lot, but I realize that they don't like it, so it doesn't feel good. I mean, we film them to tell others how awesome they are. Well, basically, yeah, I'm not doing anything wrong, but still the feeling that we're doing something bad won't go away. Local activists might come in and start lecturing you. Have they lectured you before? Yes, they said filming the Amish is bad, they don't like it. I'm just setting you up for it. It seems strange to all of you that Amish don't like being filmed, and there's logic behind it. Modern technology is denied by some not because they're afraid that a car or an electrical outlet will steal their soul. They believe that technological innovations like the camera or television awaken selfishness and pride in men, which are contrary to their basic principles – modesty, humility, patience and the pursuit of the common good. Many people make their own compromises using technology at work and in the home. For example, they have electricity in their farms or for communication purposes they install a common phone box in the neighborhood. For the Amish, vanity is a mortal sin. Vanity is defined as in any attempt to talk about yourself, to show off and to make yourself look good. I've asked one of the Amish we've been talking to what was the worst moment of their life. He said, the worst moment of my life was when they put my picture on the front page of the local village newspaper. And they put the picture there because they got an amazing collection of drawings of animals. It was back when he was still back in high school and it took him a long time to get over it. And he still remembers it with a shudder the moment his picture was on the front page of the newspaper. The Amish hate popularity, but they understand what a comfortable environment is. What can they do in the back? Well, they have some business, they've got a bank account and they need to put money in to pay taxes. They live ordinary lives just like all Americans. They do exactly the same things. If he has revenue, he's coming here, takes it to the bank, earns $20, brings it back and puts it in his savings account. The banking system is used like any other. What does a typical provincial American bank look like? As we know, Americans really don't like to get out of their cars, so even the bank can be reached by a car. There's a driveway right behind me and you can drive the car to the ATM, to the window and basically do whatever you need to do. But because we are in a place where Amish people live, Amish people come to the bank on the horses, then some banks, as well as other establishments, will have a full-fledged stall where you can keep your horse or there'll be a place to tie those horses up. If you suddenly want to walk to the bank, note the hooves, the horseshoes trail in the center. And there's two narrow tracks on the side from the carriages. As we can see, there's a car park. 
an ordinary car park for well cars and this thing there for tying up the horses. There's also a space for bikes, sorry for their scooters. I mean, that's all the local people here need, to park and lock a scooter, tie up a horse or park the car and go to the bank. There's also a shovel here so you can clean up the manure after your horse. Someone here has already done it. The perfect cleanliness here is simply astounding. We're far away from a big city and it's absolutely perfectly clean here. Sometimes I think of the Russian province all covered in weeds, deserted houses and all that, and compared to that, the Amish live in a fairy tale. Perfect fields, perfect lawns, everything looks beautifully groomed, no rubbish. Look at the curbs, there's a lawn everywhere, there's no fences. You want to stay here, live and be happy. But they won't let me stay here. Let's have a look at what products are in demand here. So here is a children's toy excavator. A stunningly simply made toy made of god knows what, costing 20 bucks. But still, it's a fun thing to have to dig with in a sandbox. There are these little cedar carts, bicycle cars, these sort of bike scooters, I'm not too sure what they're actually called. They have big wheels on them, and Amish are often driving around on them. And there is a selection of shovels, pruning shears, pitchforks. It's just amazing. There are sledgehammers, axes, devised for sharing cows and for dogs. In standard American stores, almost everything is automated, but here, people here do everything with their hands. That's why they have all of these stuff, they actually need it. There are some very unusual things that are sold here. You know, in Russian village, people also do everything with their hands, but there is no such choice. Friends, if any of you are living in a Russian village, tell me what the shops look there now. Maybe I'm wrong, but when I was in our Russian shops, they sold rubber boots, some very cheap food, and at best, one shovel and one axe. Here they have an incredible choice of the tools for the garden, for the house, it's fantastic. That's how many different wellies there are. These are some nice wellies, they have such a big choice of ropes. It's just that there's everything you might need to buy if you're working in the countryside. It's got a stand here with springs, springs to suit all tastes. In Russia, of course, there are this type of stores, they sell all this stuff too, but it's just in big cities, big shopping center, like Leroy Merlin or whatever else there is. Here, we are currently in the middle of nowhere. So they're like paraffin lamps, right? Which you just hang in your house, and they're battery powered. Yes, and you see the Chinese only make the lamp top part, but the slower part isn't manufactured by them, it's made by the Amish themselves. And here's a fan. I've never seen a battery powered fan. Here's a LED lamp for a scooter. A wide range of leather gloves. For my experience, it's not like this everywhere. Mm -hmm. They have it all here because there's a demand. That's why it's all for sale. The problem in Russia is that people in the villages have no money and the villages are basically degenerating, slowly dying. Farms in Krasnodar Krai still grow something. But if you go to Moscow, to Tver region, even just the outskirts of Moscow, there are no such shops there. What's actually surprising about the Amish shops is that they often just don't have a salesperson in them, but nobody steals anything. Oh, that's funny. Somebody left a note here. Lena King says, I forgot to bring cash. I took four dozens of eggs. I'll pay next time. Thank you. That's nice. And you can put your checks in here. Is there anything in the fridge? Yes, there are some eggs. It's all full of eggs and lemonade. It's kombucha. 
and it's three dollars for a dozen of eggs. And these are actually free-range chicks. They aren't hatchery raised, they are the healthiest chickens. Anyway, the main problem is finding people. Because even on a farm that sells something, it's self-service. You see this house with a crescent moon? It's an outdoor toilet. Another Amish shop. What do they sell here? They have strawberries for $3.50. They sell salt, some herbs, jam. More jam, salsa, plants in cups. And do you put the money in this little bag here? No. There's a chair right here. There's no security lock or anything, one can steal the money. You just lift this up, open the lid and there's money. So for example, we buy strawberries, let's say we have five dollars and the strawberries are 350. So we have to get our own change. So we take out the money, we find a dollar and 50 cents. Well, I'm not taking the 50 cents, but as you can see, there's some change in this jar. So we put in five dollars, we take out the dollar, we close the jar. It's not store-bought strawberries, not Mexican, feels like it's locally grown. They might even be tasty. Let me pour some water over it, I don't think it's been washed. Do you guys think that it's possible to have something like this in Russian villages? So that there is a stall and a money jar and as you can see there's no owner, no one. Would it be possible to organize something similar in Russia? This is where they sell sprouts, they sell tomatoes, flowers and stuff like that. You can take anything you want, put the money in and that's it. I lived in Russia a long time ago in Pesaka region. They sell potatoes there in the same way. Just on the edge of the road there's a bucket full of potatoes. You come, you pay, you pick up your potatoes, you leave. It happens sometimes. Can't say that there's some variety and you can get your own change, but it's self-service. But children in the role of salespeople are quite common in Russia too. Let's buy some strawberries. Sweet? Mm -hmm. There's kids selling it. Mm. Smells good. Can I have one? Strawberries. <laughs> See, they're writing it all in a notebook. How old are you? I'm 12. 12. And you? Five. 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 What okay. is your name? Steven Junior. Oh, say, say it again, please. Steven Junior. Steven. And you? Linda. Linda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm Dennis. <laughs> Ilya. Press button for service. Okay. Yeah. And that's fine. Then you want to get a dollar more? Oh, it's 20. You owe me 15. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they have an education problem here. They really can't count. Is uh, that right? Uh, that's right. <laughs> so you want the coins yet? No, I'm good. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Tomatoes. They're not from their farm, right? It's their tomatoes. Ah, they've grown them in the greenhouse? Yes, do you want some tomatoes? They don't smell. Do you think they'll be nice? I don't know. Is it tasty? Yes, I like it. She says she loves them. Little shops like this can be even more interesting to tourists than to the Amish themselves. And the locals are quite happy to go to the regular supermarkets. Here is a supermarket. What have we got here? There is an ordinary car park in front of the supermarket. Car parking and horse parking where these Amish buggies are parked. So the man bought food in the supermarket and is carrying a trolley. It's just like everywhere else. They come to the car park, go shopping into the supermarket and so on. But for some reason they don't have cars and I can't understand why. I mean, there's not even some kind of a religious thing like when the Orthodox Jews have their own shops, their own kosher food. It's a normal supermarket, they use the usual services, the usual banks, but at the same time, for example, they only dress like this. They're riding their buggies and so on. 
It's very strange and interesting. So that's what a farmer market looks like. Well, it's a market for tourists because with their unusual lifestyle, Amish naturally attract attention. And in this region, it's not everywhere, they live in many American states, but only in Pennsylvania they made it into a huge tourist industry. Their conservative lifestyle has created a huge influx of tourists who come to see them. Markets like this are made for tourists, although some Amish still shop here. You can see who's who by their clothes. They sell souvenirs, different local products. Something that's very popular is making a patchwork quilt like this one here. You can actually buy this one. They're very fond of all sorts of Bible quotes. Things to do with God. Let's go find God. Pray more, believe and so on. They're very much into all this cute stuff and this is where they sell these things for tourists too. Atheists who are far from God come here to meet people who believe strongly in God. Such strange tourism of non-religious people to religion. What do you think of this picture? Jesus is my guide leading me. Since it all has Swiss and German roots, they have sausages in batter, pretzels and things like that. It's an Amish thing and they have this business all across America. Tell the people what it tastes like. They'll be very interested in hearing that. It tastes like a homemade soup made by their mom. Did you want mayo on it? Yeah, yes, of course. Thank you. Mm. There's a lot of starch, you can't feel much asparagus. It's edible. It's also got some salad, it's a serving like this one and meatballs with nothing. It's like a home kitchen, there's a cooker. There's no dishwasher or anything like that. And they always have an older woman who's a manager and she has young people working for her. There's one important thing that you have to understand about the electricity and stuff. They can often use it for business. I mean, if the business requires it, they can kind of turn a blind eye to it and they can use it. It's funny how touristy the prices are in the market here. It's quite expensive. And if you go to the shop the local go to, the price tag there will be three times as low. Three times? Yes, on some products. You see, organic products are very popular right now. Yeah, and the Amish products are as organic as it gets. You can probably find a product that's more organic. And so, of course, the prices are high. But it's all important, not local, no? I mean, those apples aren't local, are they? Well, it's just not an apple season yet, so people are selling these apples. But in the autumn, when the harvest is underway, they sell their own. My point is that they are good at monetizing this trend. People know what they produce is tasty. Yes, but they're not the ones growing it, they're just selling it. Yes, these tomatoes are probably local, but... Well, if they have their own harvest, that's what they'll be selling. If their tomatoes or anything else is not fully grown, they're going to import it. It's a vegetable shop. Why don't they use cars? Life must be busy with. No, hang on. Look, a car takes as much time as anything else. He could have bought an old car. He bought an old tractor and he's trying to fix it 24 hours a day. I mean, he drives forklifts, he uses a tractor, sometimes an old one and so on. But they don't use the car out of principle. That's why such a block is specifically on a personal vehicle. Another village shop filled to the brim with all sorts of super interesting stuff. I don't even want to go in so I don't get upset. That's how many different lawnmowers they have, I want to buy all of them. 35 different kinds of wheelbarrows. So many different hen houses and rabbit houses. And of course, the fashionable buggy that an Amish came here in. I like the warning, it says don't throw manure on the grass. This is apparently a big problem. You see it there? Outside one of the village shops, we managed to speak to an Amish guy who had come here shopping in a buggy. This is your horse. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You ride a horse all the time? 
Well, we have like taxi taxi drivers, you know, if we want to go somewhere like to work in the morning, we'll go with a driver. And so it's a regular guy, the driver is like a right. regular American, not, not the Amish. Right, right, right. And why don't you use cars? I don't really know if I could answer that. You know, our forefathers never used cars. Because it's tradition. I think like so, yeah, like the tradition of the way you are, the, the way, the way we brought up. Have you ever, uh, ever drive yourself? Car? Yeah, yeah. car. No, no never. never. And you never want to drive? On the horse? Never, no. <laughs> but it's more comfortable. It's easy. Yeah, I'm sure. But it, I think it's more like it used to. I'm not sure <laughs> how to word it, but... What are you happy with that, right? It's the style of life. You right, ride in the cars we, and you're happy. You don't need the car. That's how we grew up, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's a lot to that. How you get, how you, how you were brought up. I think. It's, like it's, if you would want to start to be Amish, how would it feel? Huh? How would it feel now? You would put your car away and you start driving a buggy. Uh, never, I never ride in the buggy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just. I'm just Talking. I'm just talking. <laughs> How old are you? Uh, 58. 58. 58. This is your children? Grandchildren. Grandchildren. Yeah. And how many children you have? Six. We have three Six. boys and three girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our youngest one just had their first baby this week. Wow. A situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all married. And you live all, all your life in one country county? Do you travel? Like in the have you ever, ever been abroad in uh, the United uh, States? We don't, we don't travel much. No, no, you know, don't travel? Like once a year, we, once a year our, family, like our family all gets together uh -huh. for three days somewhere in Cabot Mountains. Uh-huh. But it's, it's not far from here. No, like 60 miles. Maybe. Have you been ever in New York City? Oh, yeah. You've been? What do you do in New York City? Well, I used to have a gazebo business, ah. so we made gazebos in uh -huh. the days, and we had dealers in Long Island. Ah, I got it. So, I went over there a couple of times. What do you think about the New York City? It's a oh, crazy man. place. <laughs> oh my goodness. We actually have, right now, we have like a, a little small shop that we make furniture, custom furniture. Uh -huh. And a guy's working for us that used to live in Italy. Uh huh. And he moved to New York. And he did landscaping in New York City. Uh huh. He said, I'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and you've never been uh, abroad? In, a, in a Mexico or other uh, seas? Never. Canada. I was in Canada a couple of times. Oh. Ah. Okay, so. Travel, what? I mean, we did there for a while. Yeah, but when we were making gazebos, we had a uh, dealer, business. dealer in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, as our interlocutor confirmed, Amish aren't a fan of traveling and you can go far on horseback. But then how did they end up in America? Anabaptists from whom the Amish descended were disliked in Europe. At the time of the Reformation they insisted that a person must be baptized at the conscious age, not as an infant. Their views on baptism and the role of the church were considered dangerous and radical. That's why in Catholic and Protestant countries Anabaptists were persecuted, tortured and executed as heretics. The same fate awaited the seceded Amish. In the late 17th century they began moving to North America chasing a better life, more specifically to the new colony of Pennsylvania. Its creator, William Penn, declared complete religious freedom in the territory. Penn himself belonged to the Quakers, such a radical protested movement who were persecuted in England. So he sought to create a society of equality and tolerance in the new colonies. With his ideas about liberty, Penn attracted the Amish here, a large part of whom moved to Pennsylvania in the 18th 20s and 30s. The newly arrived Amish settled in Lancaster County. This American region is still considered to be their main center. This is where they hold public events and interact with tourists who generate income for the communities. In total, Pennsylvania is home to more than 84,000 Amish, 41,000 of whom live in Lancaster County. Their total number in the US has more than doubled in the last 20 years. In 2000, there were fewer than 175,000 Amish living in the country. 
that figure has now risen to 355,000. Judging by the growing number of Amish, they're not living poor and can afford to support many children. And their houses look pretty impressive. This is what the Amish home looks like. Here's a buggy garage and the house itself. They actually have some really cool houses. I mean, it's so ordinary, but there are also some really expensive houses. But surprisingly, there's not an expensive car outside an expensive house, but an ordinary buggy. It's a shame that I can often only talk with the Amish without cameras. Why, why, why you don't like the pictures? I don't know. It's just... It's all cute, right? Uh-huh. It's like a tradition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if someone, like, uh, just... Anyway, take it. What do you feel? You know, bad or you don't care? It's not that we feel bad, but we don't like our papers. I mean, our pictures in the paper and stuff. Ah, in the paper. It's not the paper, it's a digital now. Right. But is it different for you, the paper or the digital? Or it's still the, still the picture? It's still a picture, mm -hmm. yeah. I got it. Like, you never know, like, if somebody just said they're going to take a picture and mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to put it in the paper, but you never know. Mm -hmm. And what's the problem with the paper? If, what's that? If somebody put your picture in the paper, so uh, what's the problem for you? What's happened? <laughs> what happened? Why is that? Uh, it's not going to, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah. And how old are you? I'm 19. 19. Yeah. And you? 17. 17. Oh. He finished the school? Yeah. Um, next level of your life is a farmer. What's that? Marriage. You, you Mar feel when you finished the school when you got married? Uh, whenever I want to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you, you didn't get married before you wanted to, did you? Um, yeah, that's this true. <laughs> Nobody married. <laughs> you don't want to. Yeah, that's right. You have the, like a. I, 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 I show the own spring. It's uh, like a period. When you feel free to do anything you want, yeah. it's uh, like the age yeah. of 16 or 17. Yeah. Do you, do yeah, you yeah. get a room springer? Yeah. What you did? Uh, I, know what I, I, don't. I heard you can travel and whatever you want, do whatever yeah. you want, you can move to the New York City. city uh, drink alcohol, go. No, we don't drink club. alcohol. You don't drink alcohol? Never. You never try it? No, I never drank alcohol. What about a smoking? Yeah. You can smoke. You wanna do with the uh, wife, the other people live like the driving the cars, uh, going to the cinemas. Or... Now that's the Amish home. And look, an important part of the home is the gas storage. The house itself is quite modern, fancy. I don't think it's cheap to build a house like this. Regarding how the Amish build their homes, I think a lot of people have seen videos on the internet when Amish get together, pick up a barn and move it somewhere else. If they need to build a big barn, then all the members of the community come together and build a barn in a day. It's probably the only place in the world where people build what they need themselves, helping neighbors and relatives. This kind of communal building actually answers the question of how even not the rich people can afford such big houses and farms. They're just being helped by everyone, the whole village, so to speak. I also think it's important to note that the Amish build things for decades. The things they build are always beautiful, very high quality. They don't migrate, they never move. And unlike Americans, who often build houses in a very pragmatic way, that is, they don't build a house to inherit to their children or grandchildren. In America, this story has been over for a long time. People often move to other states when they retire. Amish aren't planning to go anywhere. They're building houses that will serve them for a lifetime. They have a good, solid, very high quality construction. There's a bit of a problem. Or maybe not a problem, but a gift of fate. Because today is the 26th of May. As it turns out, it's the Feast of the Ascension of the Lord, which is celebrated on the 40th day after Easter. And nothing is open today. And we don't yet understand how the Amish celebrate this holiday because the Christian tradition is to go to the temples, worship services and so on. But what's the problem for the Amish? They don't have temples. This is a good time to talk about the Amish religion. They are professing Christians, they are Protestants. 
but it's not that simple. The Amish apply all of the biblical precepts in practice. They love their enemies, deny violence and forgive insults. They're baptized at a conscious age. A member of the congregation must be baptized when they're from 18 to 22 years old. If a person, for example, does not want to remain at the congregation, before being baptized he or she can officially refuse and leave the community. They can visit their family and friends in the future. That said, the Amish practice excommunication. This is when a baptized offender can be banished from the community forever and there's no way of going back. Amish territories are divided into districts. In each such district there are two or three priests, one deacon and one bishop. Actually, they're the ones setting up the main set of rules of life and living followed by the Amish of the county. That's why different counties may have different laws. Any Amish male can become a priest. They are warned about this even before they get baptized. By the way, you don't need to have any specialized training to become a priest here. It's all a matter of the lot. The Amish of one county pray all together every second Sunday. The service takes around three hours. What's interesting is that most communities don't have separate temples and they simply use the homes of the parishioners for different ceremonies. And from house to house they transport special long benches which are placed at the site of the service. So we are now pulling to the Amish home for tonight's holiday service. It's fully parked here. There are people all dressed up there. You can see the number of people here that have come here. The horses are all stabled. And here's also a buggy park for those who didn't have enough space. Here comes another crew, the kids are all excited. It's beautiful. If yesterday was a work day and they were in plain clothes, today they're all in festive clothes. They looked incredibly cool, nice and just awesome yesterday too, but today they really look like some kind of fairy tale picture. I want to become Amish. I look at them and it's amazing. Are you ready to get up at 5 am to plow the fields? Can I just be a happy Amish and not work? <laughs>
And that's one of her very beautiful pictures. Your average tourists don't get shots like this. Yeah. You know, I, I, I get to be friends with these guys and they let me on their farm and I chase them through the fields and get some photos. What do you think if, if we ask him to film and he say it okay or...? A lot of these guys will. I, in fact, one of my uh, ladies I drive, her son asked me to photograph him while he was out in the field and he, he wants a copy. Since it's a holiday, a lot of people bring their children to see the railway model. I don't really know why exactly they like it so much, but there are a lot of families coming here. Uh, sorry, uh, what's the date today? Why people come here? Uh, probably tour Chichi Barn. What is this? Uh, we're tourists. I, I came from Russia. Okay. First time here. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a holiday for us today. Ah. Uh -huh. The Ascension Day. It's uh, like a national holiday or it's a local? No, just, just mostly under the Amish people. Ah, yeah. it's Amish holiday. Yeah, ah, it, it would be a church holiday. Yeah. Church holiday. Yeah. Sorry, and why don't you use cars? Why everybody comes on a horse? It's what we've always used. You never use it or it's because of holiday or? No, no, we never use it. Never use, why? No. Never drive a car? No, this is our transportation. Oh. What's the reason, why? Old ways. Yeah, be the ways our forefathers had, yeah. And you yeah. you never drive car? No. Never? Try it. No. no, okay, let's go. Why you drive the horses? Why drive it's the It's a 21 foot century. It's, it's fine. It's fun? Yeah. Just because it's fun? <laughs> no, I really it's fun. But it's the, re the real reason. There's a, that's our uh, our guidelines with our uh -huh. church. Is it for the church? So it's forbidden to drive car? Yes. What's happened if you accidentally drive the car? It's, uh, well, we, we it's like a scene or...? We don't do that. You don't do it. You never try it. You never... No, we, we just get a driver. Like, we, we hire a driver to take us places. Uh, you were driving like a passenger. Yeah. Ah, but never we, drive it by yourself. No. Oh. <laughs> but, but you use cars for farming if you need uh, some special cars. I... No. Tractors, no? No. no. I sold it, uh, the guy in the hut like yours uh, to drive in the uh, bobcat or the small machine. Uh, we, we would do that, yeah. But like our, for the farming, for the field work, they, they ah. use horses for mules. What's interesting is that each family has slightly different festive attire. That is, they are all in the same style. Everyone has more or less the same identical costumes. Everybody goes to see that steam train. They live here their whole life and it's been here their whole life. Man, how many steam train rides can you take? And people still ride the steam train. We came to the town of Strasbourg in Lancaster County. It was named after a French town Strasbourg, the settlers from which were the first inhabitants here. American Strasbourg is not known for its fares, but for its trains. It's even been called the train capital of the United States. It's home to the oldest active railway in the entire Western Hemisphere. It was laid out in 1832. What surprises me about the Amish, apart from lifestyle of course, is the way they spend their free time, the way they relax. Here we are now at the railway station. The kind of tourist railway where people just ride in a steam train. And so they live in this region. They were born here, they live here and they are likely to die here. And that's pretty much one of the few attractions here. And yet they don't go to the other Lancaster towns, don't walk the main streets, don't drive to New York City, but spend their time here in their homeland, riding the steam locomotive which they must have ridden 300 times in their lives. Well, that actually surprises me. Because one always seems to want something bigger and newer. They live in such a way that they don't want anything else, they already have everything. Again, going back to the question of happiness. Would you be happy? Well, you're saying you'd like to be Amish. Would you be happy if you were brought to ride the steam train every week? I don't think so. They're all smiling as well. This little Amish is so cute. And they're really close with their family. They go to restaurants or they take food from home that they've cooked and they come here and they'll probably have some kind of picnic. Look, some families even have this little trailer cart they use to haul all this stuff around. 
There's some kind of little railway. Yes, it's little road with a little train for little kids to ride on. There's a whole family standing around waiting for eight children to board. They have eight children in the family. And by the looks of it, it's not over yet. There's a regular family on the right and an Amish family on the left. Tell me, isn't that the cutest holiday you've had lately? It's actually really cute, yes. There are these people riding steam trains and everyone's very nice. So that's what the carriages look like. There are these nice seats. Again, everything is original. They restored these chairs. People started boarding this train now. By the way, you can flip this seat so you can choose which way they've turned to. Look at these lamps. It now has light bulbs inside it, but it used to be the usual paraffin one. Each carriage has its own interior. And just like in the other carriage, you can flip the seats over. There are several families already sitting here. Luxury furnace everywhere. They're from 1850 to 1870s. When the Amish come here in their clothes, it's like you've traveled in a time machine. And that's some kind of performance. But no, it's the reality. This is how people actually live. The railway in Strasbourg is awesome. Well, let's take a look at the city itself. And now I'm going to show you what a provincial small American town with a small population looks like. Well, it looks like a fairy tale. And you can't say it's some kind of a super popular destination that people come here from all over the country, or there's very good economy. It's a regular American province. Dennis won't lie. I disagree that it's an unpopular destination. Amish generate a huge flow of tourism, so their prices, including property, are quite high. And I wouldn't say it's typical. It's in a good location with a clientele that it's passing through. That's why we're going to set it apart from the usual towns. What's cool is that it's very cozy and old. In fact, America, a seemingly young country, was founded quite a long time ago. There's a banner hanging on the pole that the city was founded in 1730. I like the kind of business here. Look, you and I are at the crossroads. What do we see? We see an antique shop, we see a pizzeria on that side, there was a barber shop, another antique shop, a bank, and we have an ice cream cafe behind us. This is the type of business they have in the city center here. Strasbourg isn't the Amish capital. Lancaster County is much more popular in that respect. The sign reads 1780. That's when this house was built. Each house has a date plaque on it. Yes, so that's the date this house was built and here are a few packages from Amazon that someone who lives here has ordered. They just put them here under the door at one of the central crossroads. So it's one of the main streets of this little town, it's just a pavement. No CCTV cameras, nothing. Well, how's that possible? Well, we have a camera. Yes, so there is a camera now, but still, there are just two parcels lying there in everyone's sight and no one's stealing them. Do you know what people who steal parcels are called in the US? There's a special term for them. Porch pirates. There are those who steal 
parcels from the porches. That's one of the downsides in big cities like Brooklyn, for example, and many ask you, the delivery drivers, to hide it behind something like a shed or something, because people just walk down the street and take others' parcels. The next house is some sort of cafe and there's a sign, 1796. Another shop, a vintage shop actually. I think there's like four of them in town. If anything's for sale here, it's all out on the street. No particular valuables, but nevertheless, this is how someone has decorated their shop. What I like about this town is this unity of the development. I mean, even with newly built houses, nothing is out of style. Even if they're constructing something new, they build them in the same sort of style. Because of this, the town is picturesque and pleasant to walk around. Look at this house on the other side of the road, it's amazing. It was built in 1855. There's this nice terrace, a flag. Well, it's beautiful. And there's a very cozy pavement here too. If you go into the courtyard there again, you can see how well maintained everything is. They have perfect lawns, greenery everywhere. There's a cemetery there too, and there are no fences around it. Here it's already someone's private property, but there's not a single fence. It looks absolutely amazing wherever you look. They don't build like that anymore. If they were building this town right now, the houses would be set back from the street. They would stand further away because there'd be less noise and more privacy. And back in the days when there were horse-drawn carts, when snow clearing was a big problem, the houses were built close to each other, so they're as close together as possible. That's why the old houses are usually very close together. There are plots where houses are a little bit further from each other, but closer to the road. Note how there's a street here and there are no fences. Trumpists live here, they've already planted their flag. Let's take back America in 2024. Here they are supporting Trump. Well, they also keep their place relatively tidy. In terms of tidiness, I think that Amish generated around themselves. They set the bar and so you start doing something too. I mean, imagine you're in some city, you went out in the area when there's rubbish lying around, all the houses are in ruins, you go to work in the underground, you're in a bad mood. As soon as you get out of your house, you're no longer happy. And if you live in a flowery neighborhood, as nice as this one is, you came out, you saw it and your spirits lifted. And when your lawn will have grown out, when you have weeds growing somewhere on your property, you'll notice it right away. You're going to want to get rid of it, clean it up. I can't say that everything came out perfect here, the lawn isn't perfect at all, but people try to make things beautiful here. Talking about less than perfect lawns, Dennis, I'm just saying that you just got too used to it. When a person lives in America, they see a little less than perfect lawn and say that it's not all that good. I can tell you that you won't find lawns like this in Russia, even in the big cities that are getting huge money to maintain all these lawns. In the little yards near blocks of flats, you may not know, but in the spring, the janitors, they rake all that foliage down to the bare ground. It's very difficult to simply find a lawn that you can just sit on. And if we try to find something like that in a provincial town, they'll only have them in Rublevka or Barivka, the elite cottage estates near Moscow where all the rich people used to buy property. And I still doubt they'll have as many perfect lawns there. By the way, I have a video about Rublevka, be sure to check it out. I'm just saying that there's a different America where things are a little different. It exists too, but thankfully it's a minority. Most of the cities are very nice, neat and beautiful. This building is actually a mall or something. There are different tenants here. See, there's a list of them. There's an engineer here, a florist, a lawyer. So it's like the business center of the village. 
There are actually three business centers in this village of 2000 people. Look at this. Someone must have actually come here and planted all this. Somebody chose to do it. I mean, they could have not done it. They could have just thrown a lot of pebbles and left it at that. But people want it to be beautiful. There are often problems with signage design in America. They're rubbish here. In this village, someone went to the trouble of ordering signs. Somebody hired a man that designed it, made the sign board so that you can change the little signs. It looks beautiful. They've ordered the logo, designed the stickers, made the signage. It feels good. Here's another one. Yeah, it's probably a brewery by the looks of it. The paradox of America is that when in general in Russia, the larger the city and the closer it is to the center, the more order, cleanliness and beauty there'll be. While in America, it is often the opposite. And this kind of province with a small population is going to be neater than downtown New York. Because often in Manhattan, where Dennis likes to live, it's full of rubbish. I actually live in New Jersey. But am I right about Manhattan? Yes, Manhattan unfortunately suffers from these vices. It's the same if we look at San Francisco. It's full of some homeless people, there's rubbish and so on. Where do tourists actually come to in America? For most first-timers to America, New York is Manhattan, so they go there. They see all these skyscrapers, they walk around the streets there, and then they come back saying America's so dirty, it's terrible, because they think that if NYC is like this, if you have roads like this, so much rubbish in the center of the biggest city, What's left to say about the province? Because their life experience tells them that it will always be worse in the provinces than in a big city in the center. To find the beauty and tidiness you need to come here, a village that has a population of around 3000 people. Here is like a fairy tale. What year is that? It's 1700, 1754. Wow, this is actually someone's house. It just stands there out of one of the big streets and no one thought of damaging and removing the shutters. Not one of the owners took those shutters, threw them out. They're still here. That's beautiful. Just have a look how it's all looked after. Again, I have to mention the lawn. We only have such lawns around the Kremlin and on Rublevka. A perfect lawn, landscaping design, I can't believe it's all in the middle of nowhere. And there's no fences anywhere. I mean, you're walking around, you're doing fine, it's the main street of a small town and BAM! There are these awesome, beautiful and orderly lawn and trees. On the other side of the road there are these perfect brick houses. There's none of that cheap stuff, no one's covering their houses with ugly siding materials, everything's covered in flowers. No corner has been left behind. There's this little nice horse, there's a wrath here, this one's from 1786. Look what miracle! It's an 1874 door. It's the original door. Yeah, it's an original door with a letterbox. Look at this handle. It seems there are Jews living here. All this order and cleanliness, it is maintained by the residents. It's not like the mayor is going to clean this place up like this. It's just that the owner of the building, they keep the establishment clean and tidy. There's a barn in the background. You can't really see it from the street. And one might have thought, it doesn't matter what it looks like, no one can see it, but this person just goes and makes a beautiful luxury barn. You'll also notice that the decor isn't just there, it's changing. They're currently preparing for the 4th of July, oh sorry, the Memorial Day. So it's Remembrance Day, so American flags are lifted and placed on soldiers' graves. So once the Memorial Day is over, they will likely change the decor for the 4th of July. They'll have a wreath of American flags and so on. And then Christmas will come and there will be a Christmas wreath. For Thanksgiving, they'll have something different. Probably something with pumpkin and corn and stuff. People change the decor of their houses all the time. It's a constantly ongoing process. They didn't just plant a flower here and forgot about it. They're always doing something about. You can see that the town is alive, that it's not a showcase, it's a living organism. Judging by the architecture, it's always been a wealthy city. These aren't poor houses. When they were built, it was evident that the people who built them had quite a decent income. The house across the street is so pretty architecturally wise. It's not just they built something. They've worked with an architect, they brought the materials from somewhere far away. It's a nice house. Once again, it's a small town, there are only 3000 people living here now. Before that, there were 500 to 1000 people, after the war, there were 2000 people, 
thousand people, it's a relatively small town. In Russia, there are plenty of such small towns just outside Moscow. There are these big mansions, streets where businessmen live and so on. But these cities unfortunately don't exist in Russia except rare towns like Zuzdal or Ples, which are a few of the towns that actually got a big budget and got restored. But also, if we trace from region to region here, most towns will be like this one. It's not like we're in this perfect town and their neighbors are drowning in rubbish, it's the norm. But in Russia, it's actually interesting to see what a 3,000-something town in Russia actually looks like today. You can take a walk via Google Maps. This is actually the first house we've seen with a fence, but this fence is mostly transparent. Look, this house and the one over there have original poles to tie up horses. I think that it's been here since the house was built. It's probably just been moved closer over here, but the actual artifact is original. Look, there's a candle in every window and it's beautifully lit. The downside of the Amish is that all the row sites are in manure. Hang on, there's an American lorry driving past us. That's the most unkept area by the house so far. Hang on, it just seems that there's different types of grass growing here. That's not weeds, that's some kind of... Nah, it's not different types of grass. Yes, it is. And apparently, it looks like this house is actually unoccupied. There's no one looking after it. I can't rule out that it's just an elderly person living here who has a hard time doing the lawn. So it might have been that a neighbor helped here and there to make it look a little bit better, but it doesn't look all that terrible. I've noticed that it doesn't look terrible either. It's just not well looked after by local standards. This house looks quite new. Well, let's see. It's from 1787. Do you think that's new? No, but we've seen older houses. Yes, but it's made out of wood. It's not even covered by anything. There's no siding here, no brick cladding. That's pure wood with nothing extra. By the way, I saw a house like this being dismantled here. And so these wooden bars were sold separately and they were quite expensive because they're well dried and they're in demand. It's not rubbish, it's good building material that can be used elsewhere. Well, once again, it's very important to realize that here in this American province, there is all the infrastructure to make traveling here more comfortable. There are some restaurants, even chain restaurants, there are snack bars and so on. There's a Starbucks here. But nevertheless, even if we go all the way to the regional center, to Lancaster, we'll see a great number of excellent coffee shops, where they do specialty coffee from some amazing beans and some other decent restaurants. And here, there are normal roads, there are car parks, patrol stations, in general, everything is created so you can drive around the country and do it in comfortable conditions. In Russia, as you know, there are problems with this. Even from Moscow to St. Petersburg, it's difficult to get via small towns. By the way, I recently took a trip down the old tract, the same way the famous 17th and 18th century Russian writers Radishev and Pushkin traveled from Moscow to St. Petersburg and, to my great disappointment, watched the ruins that are left of the used-to-be palaces. I've seen total poverty. There's this speedway from Moscow to St. Petersburg and there's a high-speed electric trains on the railway that people are whizzing from point A to point B, missing the small towns. And in this way, even big towns like Vishni, Volochi, everything is in ruins. Everything looks terrible, nothing's being restored and there's complete degradation. Although it would seem that there's a big potential, so many tourists could have come there, it's quite easy to get there, but for some reason people choose not to. And when you look at how it can be, you realize that really our small towns could also be the same. And people would travel to these places and there would be life in these towns. I try to find out if houses are for sale here. It's always a question that pops up in my mind when I see such beautiful places. So here's what I found. Firstly, there are virtually no houses for sale here, especially the old historical ones. People don't want to sell them even at an inflated price, although there's demand for houses outside of the big cities. But yes, I'm not too sure if that's applicable to this town too. 
But for example, there's an ordinary house for sale here, just over there in the direction we're going. And it's not a historical building or anything, just a three bedroom house with two bedrooms and it's priced at $309,000. That's the price tag in this region. So it's not a million dollars, but it's not 100,000 either. From my personal experience of traveling around America, and I've been to many places, not everywhere, but many, and that includes provincial places, the states that are far away. Pennsylvania is still a pretty good place in that sense. It's quite rich, everything's alright here, but there are states that are much poorer. Oklahoma's one of them. You can definitely find horrid places and things everywhere if you're searching for it, but again, from my experience, at least 80% of America is perfectly decent. Well-maintained, beautifully livable grounds. It's in big cities like New New York where the controversies start. The fact that it's dirty doesn't mean it's bad there, it just means that not everyone will like it. The dirty towns and cities make up around 20% of the US. That's how it looks for me. Again, I've seen far from everything. You have to travel and discover the world with your own eyes, instead of having someone else tell you whatever they want to. Another very interesting location. Look how many horses there are, how many of these buggies. And for good reason. There are two courts where guys play baseball. And they seem to be amateurs. There are their parents and other adults watching. The stands are quite busy. Interestingly, the stands are divided by gender. That's where the men sit and there's where the women sit. And best, there are elderly women and elderly men closer together, but young people are all separate. It's not a baseball, it's a different game. Softball. Softball. Yeah, What's the different difference? The ball is different. Yeah, it's a bigger ball. I, I, yeah. Everything uh, yeah. else is the same? You don't go around, you, you pitch on her. Ah, okay. It's more... It's not fast pitch. It's more safe for the players, I think. For the old people. Yeah, for the old people. It's uh, like a traditional image game. Yeah. What, what, what else game do, do you play? Volleyball. Volleyball and yeah. a softball. Yeah. Oh. Do you play soccer? Not so much soccer. It's just not popular or...? It's yeah, not, not at all. We are from Russia and we okay. play mostly the soccer or baseball. And yeah. Oh, you, yeah, you're a lot of, a lot of soccer there, right? Yeah, the soccer is the most popular game, yeah. Right. Do you know uh, anything about Russia? I know. Yeah. Not so much. <laughs> Do you know that Russia exists? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh! You <like> it. <laughs> How are they today? Yeah. What's the holiday? Ascension Day. Ascension Day. It's uh, like the national holiday or it's... Um, not so much. I don't think it's not so much a national holiday. It's a religious holiday. Yeah, national yeah. holiday. What do you usually do on this day? Get what? together, I guess. Uh, oh, yeah. just, yeah, yeah. The family day. Most. Family, it's a, yeah, family and friends, yeah. This is a youth group here. Of course, there is a museum of Amish culture in Lancaster County and we couldn't have missed it. Uh, welcome to the Amish Village. My name is AJ, I'm your tour guide for today. I'm just here to teach you a little bit about how the Amish live and show you what their houses are all about. The room that you're in now is called a sitting room. Amish use it for three things. You have your weddings, your funerals, this is also where you have church. It's a gas lamp, but there is a gas cylinder and it lights this lamp. This cooker is wood-fired and this is a gas fridge. I don't really understand how it works, but there is even a sign that says it's a gas fridge. There are also some irons and stuff. It's all using some sort of batteries or some kind of prehistoric stuff that runs on fire. Amish can get married to anyone they want to, even if the other person isn't Amish, it's completely okay. Just doesn't happen much. When Amish teenagers turn 16, they take a couple years to go out, see what regular life is all about, before they decide if they really want to join the church and be Amish, 
or if they want to be English instead. If you're not Amish, you're called English, no matter who you are or where you're from. When the Amish came over here to America, all there was was English people. So everybody's English to them. <laughs> so when these teenagers go out and see English life, they call this rumspringer. It's a German word that means jumping around. And that's from when you're 16 all the way until you're 25. So the teenagers will go out, they'll put boomboxes in their buggies and play it as loud as possible. Or they'll get drunk on the carriage and pass out. Then let their horse take them back to the barn. Yeah, you can actually get a DUI on a horse and buggy. It's happened before. Yeah, I heard a story the other day about an Amish guy getting out of a DUI. So he was driving drunk and while the police were chasing him, they weren't going very fast. So he decided to jump out of the buggy and let the horses keep going. So this guy jumped out and sprinted right into a field. And the police had to stop the horses first, so they never really got a chance to look for the guy, and he got away. Yeah, you think Lancaster is really nice and quiet now, don't you? <laughs> this is a farm. This one actually looks authentic. I've been to an operating farm here and the only difference is the number of animals. You can see they have tobacco drying here. This was actually quite a popular business amongst the Amish back in the day. They were growing tobacco and selling tobacco leaves to companies that make cigarettes. So they grew tobacco and they had special barns for it. It's a very clever design. They have a huge area opening up so that there is true ventilation so that dries but doesn't burn the sun and also that the moisture doesn't build up inside the barn. The barn needs to be well ventilated. It's all very mechanically thought out and is well constructed. And that's the kind of barns that those Amish who still harvest tobacco and there's a lot of them, you can see it by the number of tobacco fields, keep all of their tobacco in. The operating farm that I've been to had these exact same horse stalls and the owner was telling me that he was buying X racing horses. So when their time comes and they're no longer good for the races, the Amish buy them to hitch up to their buggies. That is, they often have quite good running horses harnessed in the buggy, which are just too old for the races and moved on to another level. Here is an example of such a small roof bridge, which can often be seen on local roads. The question is, why do these bridges have roofs? That's to protect the wood from the weather. So basically, this roof protects the bridge and extends its service life. because an unprotected wooden bridge lasts around 10 to 15 years. A covered protected wooden bridge can last up to 100 years as evidenced by local bridges. It's a lot easier to change a roof than to rebuild and replace the whole bridge itself. That's why local bridges have roofs. Now we're going to see what an Amish school looks like. There's this barn-looking door. And here's the class itself. They have mixed gender classes, but the children are separated. Boys sit on the one side, girls on the other. I read an article about their education, speculating on whether it was good or bad. We know that their education is quite primitive. They're only taught what they have to be taught and nothing else. That is, the basic course is literacy and numeracy. But they're all bilingual, they're all talking two languages. They're all learning their German and their version of Pennsylvania language. And they're learning more about, for example, the land, things about nature like livestock health. That is, they study what they need in life, things that surround them. They just don't use things like sociology, chemistry and physics in their ordinary life, so they don't have classes dedicated to it. Talking about language, look, there's a child's homework right there. And there's a picture and das Haus, das Maus. Well, I may be reading German wrong, but it's definitely German. They speak a dialect of German. To make it clearer, there's British English and American English. They sound different, but it's basically the same language and everyone understands each other. They have a similar version of German where instead of saying sound O, oh, they'll say AH, but basically they talk and understand one another. One of the funniest things I've ever seen is, well, we have another religious group who lives in the region, ultra-Orthodox Jews called Hasidim. They speak Yiddish. Yiddish is also a dialect of German. So I'm wondering how they can communicate with each other. 
because some people have a distorted version German and in others a distorted version of German. But they communicate and understand each other. And it's also interesting that when Jews have big holidays, Hasidic Jews come here, bring their children here. And there stands a Hasidic woman in her wig and looks amazed at Amish women in those old-fashioned dresses. And everyone has a look of bewilderment in their eyes. Is it possible to live like this? Is this really how people live? So they each have their own thing going on and yet each of the communes thinks they live right and others don't. Oh, and most importantly, of course, as you can see, since the school is just one classroom, there's nothing else apart from it, the toilet's outside. You shouldn't be surprised. Russia teaches us that you have to suffer. It's especially handy in winter. So yeah, that's one of the schools. It's this little shed. I think that this is gas that they use there for heating and everything else. There are small swings and there are two toilets, one for girls and one for boys. That's the whole school. So the school is just one classroom, it's behind a fence and the blinds are down since it's a day off. After feeding the brain, it's time to feed the body as well. Especially since the Amish own what's said to be the largest buffet in the United States. Let's go see what it looks like and what they feed you. If a buffet in America is usually a Chinese buffet, you've probably been there before. This is an Amish buffet. So it's their products, grown and prepared here following their recipes. And it's a possibility to actually get to know their food. You may like it, you may not, but the thing is that you can try it all in one place. Nibble, taste and conclude if you like it. You pay at the door, they give you a table and then you just eat as long and much as you can. Here are the prices. They serve breakfast. The place is open from morning to night. Breakfast, lunch and dinner. There's also some kind of early bird dinner. So it's Thursday now and it's a barbecue tonight. You're lucky. I know that you love barbecue. And it only costs $21.99 for eating non-stop. Well, isn't this heaven on earth? Pork ribs, pulled pork, brisket, fried shrimp, New York strip steak, anything you want. By the way, if it's your birthday, you can eat for free. You show your license or a different ID that has your birthday and you can eat for free. Look at the size of the buffet. You sit down, they give you a table, then they give you the cutlery. Well, if you accidentally drop them, you can still get and grab new ones there. This is not a problem. They give you a piece of paper and when you finished eating, you turn it over, which means that everything's ready to be cleaned up and is good to go. And while you're grabbing new food, people come to the table, clear the plates and take the dirty stuff. You're unlikely to do more damage to your body, your health, both physical and mental, in any other place in this region. What do they have here? Roast beef, sauerkraut, mashed potatoes, boiled ham. This is Amish food, by the way. They also have some universal dishes. Beans, Brussels sprouts and so on. Here are the famous Amish prawns that can be found in the Amish rivers. Here is their specialty pie, some American pies and some other stuff. You can add something else on the plate. There's also ice cream over here. Just look at the size of this hall. Sometimes this place is full. Just imagine how many people are eating here at the same time. That being said, it's amazing they bring up new stuff all the time. No food is coming to an end. Well, it all looks like a five-star hotel in Turkey. There's plenty of everything. They have an actually huge hall, but what surprised me was the nice price. I mean, by American standards. Eating here with taxes and all came to $25, including drinks. How are you feeling? I can't breathe. Let's go, stop eating. So what, are we flipping this over? Yes. After such a food variety, let's go look at the food again. But this time in the supermarket. So we're going to the supermarket, but it actually doesn't belong to the Amish. It belongs to a religious group we've previously mentioned, the Mennonites. 
They are more relaxed, they have more freedom to maneuver. They have a more versatile business and can run things like this. You can see who the owners are from this family photo here. As I understand, there's a founding father and his lovely wife who started this business. Well, all in all, it's just a normal supermarket with normal checkouts. There's nothing special about it. And a set of groceries. But then again, this supermarket is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, this is not even a town. It's surrounded by fields and forests and people living in some tiny little villages around it. It's a huge supermarket in the middle of nowhere. Nothing needs to be said. There's just a fun mix of products here. Of ordinary American foods and the products that Amish consume. Well, let's take a look at the books. Studying the Bible. My first Bible. Children's Bible. Bible stories in five minutes. Jokes and fun. Recipes. You'll never walk alone. Never walk alone, especially among the Amish. A time to keep silent. The books talk here, you see? Look how beautiful it is, look. We see that these people are fake, that they're just actors. What's this hairstyle? It's meant to be a bowl cut. You saw it today, didn't you? The actors can have it different, I guess. And here we have the current hot topic. The women of the Bible, for women of color. Oh, here, look. One minute with God for men. Do you have any friends you need to buy a gift in America for? I think it'll make a great gift. Just read day by day, look at all this advice, and you'll immediately understand what to do. Life is getting better in June, things start to make sense, things are changing. Come on, let's see what else they have. There's a lot of manufacturing of all sorts of local goods here, by the way. Goods produced locally. Farmers, almost all of whom are Amish, they have a lot of dairy farms. We've been driving around the area, so we've seen it all. There are a lot of farms, and they're mostly meat and dairy farms. Let's have a look at what kind of meat they sell here. You can see it's local even from the packaging. 35, 8, 9, so that's about 5 kilos of meat. 74 dollars, that's actually a brisket that you can cook. There are huge pieces and smaller ones. This neck roast piece is 44 dollars. As I understand, this meat is meant to be good without any antibiotics. Actually, in America, this sort of food isn't that popular. Well, I mean, they don't really consume it here. That's why there's no cooked ham here. But the Amish love all kinds of meat products. And so you can see stuff like this in Russian and in Amish shops. They also sell something here called raw milk. Not pasteurized milk from the cow. In New York, it's banned by law. But it's being smuggled into New York. There's a business where people come here, buy Amish groceries and bring them back to New York. But because it's not certified, it's illegal. They're kind of a subscription-based distribution service. You take certain cards, you go into certain shops, and in the backyard they'll give you a GMO-free organic products. The measurement unit here is a bushel. Do you know what that is? So this basket here is half a bushel. I honestly don't have much of an idea about bushel either. But you can hear something like, half a bushel of apples for me please, here. After the grocery store, it's time to go to the Amish liquor shop as well. By the way, Amish can actually consume alcohol. This is where the rules depend on the communities. In the most conservative, you can't drink. But in many, it is considered okay to drink a little. As for tobacco, Amish don't smoke cigarettes, but they can smoke a pipe. Wait, is that a tobacco shop called Smoke Stop? First of all, they have cigarette advertising here, which is banned in Russia. But here it says, buy American cigarettes for 630 plus tax. And there's a whole tobacco shop. And it also says on this shop, straight cigarette minimum. That is, there's a minimum price for cigarettes in each state. You can sell them cheaper. So if they put the lowest price, they write about it, we have the lowest price. Here's a big liquor shop. You must be over 21 to come in. The Americans have even made their mark here. They have 1.5 liter wine bottles, something like Magnum wine. But the shape is also ugly. And there's a very large selection of these huge bottles with 1.5 liters of Californian wine. 
с этим калифорнийским вином, полуторалитровый, вот эти вот They mostly have cheap wine in these huge bottles. There's also a giant vodka here too. Все гигантское. Americans are always craving for big packages. It's bizarre. Vodka is actually a 1.75 liter bottle. This is 30% vodka in a bottle volume of 1.75 liters. Have you ever seen a vodka bottle that big? It's 1.75 liters! I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't buy vodka a lot, but I don't think we have bottles like this. The lowest of the low, Kamchatka vodka, Vladimir vodka, they're actually plastic bottles too. Oh wow, I can't believe it. I've never seen Kamchatka vodka before. And what about Vladimir vodka? There's a Russian crown here too. Everything bad is somehow related to Russia. All of this is in plastic bottles. I couldn't get my mind around 1.75 liters vodka bottles, but they're actually selling cheap, awful vodka in plastic bottles. Absolute is also about 1.75 liters. I guess I don't know something. This one is not bad and it's $25. Stolichnaya is from Latvia, it's in glass too. Here's French vodka. You'll find a lot of strange things in American shops. Finishing our trip to the Amish, we met the Mennonites. They too are Protestants and Anabaptists who emigrated to the US from Northern Europe. The Amish and Mennonites were once the same religious movement, but then they split. Mennonites are less radicalized now. They can use in their normal life the benefits of civilization, such as the telephone and the tractor, and yet they still prefer to drive buggies and their children are unfamiliar with the internet and quadrocopter. But we introduced them to it. Do you fly a drone? Mm. No, you wanna I try? Don't. <laughs> I don't. Just push it, push it. Push it, it's gonna walk up. Huh? No. Push it down, it's going down. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> Left, right. Tuck. <laughs> the children are watching the drone. Dennis is giving the kid, I'd say, drugs, but it's even worse. You're letting a kid fly a drone. You wanna watch? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what is YouTube? YouTube, do you know? YouTube? YouTube, it's a video hosting on the internet. Do you know it? Huh? I heard of it. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm making a video for YouTube. I... He's, a, he's a YouTube blogger. Why is the uh, bag is black? We saw the gray. Gray, gray color in a... Um, the gray ones are Amish. Ah, the are gray you, one is Amish? Not Amish. No, we are Mennonites. Ah, I thought everybody who's drive, who rides a horse is Amish. Mm. Oh, cool. What's the difference between you and uh, Amish? Um, the Amish men, they have beards and... Uh-huh. You're not? No, we don't have. And uh, anything uh, except the beard? You clothes, it's like a jeans, like more, more regular, more casual than yeah, the Amish. Yeah, like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have black pants and one color shirt. Mm -hmm. Do you have electricity in the house? What? Electricity in the house. Yes. Uh, Amish not have electricity. Ah, you, you, you have. Oh, cool. So you can use el electricity? Yep. Oh, okay. Awesome. We also have a telephone. They may have a telephone, but not, not in the house. We're not supposed yeah. to. The dad came out on the terrace. Mike, shoot the valley mm -hmm. by the drone. It's okay? Yeah. Yeah. Traveling. Do you know uh, anything about Russia? You said you are from Russia? Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah, I can. I do, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, I used to work for, I used to actually work with the Russians. Hmm, really? Dmitry was his first name, I forget what his last name was. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know a lot. I mean, oh, how long are you here? for one week okay. and then I go back. Okay. Have you traveled uh, somewhere abroad your United States? No, I haven't. Um, I was in Canada, but I don't know if that counts. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been in New York? In New York yeah, City? Yeah, I have actually, yeah. What do you think? It's a crazy place for the people like you. It's absolutely different world yeah, for I'm, you. I'm, I'm out in the country, but yeah, I was, I, what was amazing about me is, I mean, I, I, mean, I was up we, we uh, the homeless we were uh, feeding i mean 
uh, in the food line for uh -huh. Bowery Missions up there. Ah, right? mm -hmm. And I remember at lunchtime we went, I, I sat in a pizza shop and I remember this big window out here and you could sit here and there's 10 different nationalities, you know, you had Japan's, you had yeah. people from Asia, you had people from Europe, I mean, everywhere. <laughs> And I'm like, man, I don't know if anywhere else in the world you could do this. Like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure. I, they, I mean, if you go into Moscow, I'm sure you have visitors there. In the it's different the people. It's mostly people from the different countries around Russia. In, in New yeah. York City, they people around the world. It's yeah. unique. Yeah. And this, this place is unique. It's a different <laughs> life and a different <laughs> job. And I have uh, one more question about the uh, difference between you and Amish people. Uh, you, you have a bicycle. You can ride it. Yeah. Why uh, Amish people don't, don't use bicycle? Well, it's kind of the yeah. old... Um, it's basically... Uh, I shouldn't say tradition. It, it was basically against their rules. It's a new, it was something new coming in. They're actually our, our area. They are starting to use bicycles yeah, yeah, now. Totally. now. Despite the slight difference, the Amish and I have a lot in common. And it's not just about old-fashioned clothes and not using cars. It's just that both are used to being content with what they have and to look for reasons for happiness within ourselves, not in the achievements of civilization. Many of us wouldn't enjoy that kind of life. But there's something interesting about this refusal of this daily newsfeed scrolling and browsing social media. For the Amish, progress is progress of the heart and progress of the mind. For us, progress is the progress of technology, of engineering. We fly aeroplanes, we use computers, but the question is whether there's less irritation, anger, rage, depression, despair within us. Maybe not. America is the world champion in per capita consumption of tranquilizers, antidepressants. The most developed countries are suicide champions and so on. And in that sense, the Amish feel perfectly well. They're happy living the way they do. Friends, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. I just want to add that the Amish are just incredibly amazing people. I find myself just really excited about everything I've seen. It's something incredible, because in our crazy lives, when we are used to the tech progress and we think we can live without it, when we are worried about Spotify being blocked, McDonald's closing down and so on, here you think that their civilization, it's 21st century America, good roads, cars, technology, everything. But people have given up on all of that. People live their lives, they keep their old culture, they don't let anyone into their communities. And yet, they are happy. You see their happy faces, you see their joyful children, you see these families and you realize that happiness may actually not really be in this crazy consumerist world in which we live. But happiness can be here on the land, in labor, in love and in tolerance. That's really amazing. It was an incredible experience. If you're ever in America, be sure to visit these places. City of Lancaster, Pennsylvania is just great. And I'll keep showing you some interesting, unusual cities, places and people. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel and if you've not already done so, do it so you don't miss out on the new videos. And to make more people aware about the wonderful Amish, share my video on social media. Go ahead and send it to your friends.